Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so <clears throat> I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and for Rahul uh, for initiating everything. Um, so if, if we look at a practical quantum experiments, right, the common uh, operation is, is to apply a circuit to some initial state and, and measure an expectation value of an observable. Right? So, so we have just uh, the expectation value of the observable. But of course, uh, at, at the moment, uh, all of the, the um, quantum computers are noisy and we can only apply noisy gates. So instead of applying our nice circuit C, we, we actually apply a noisy circuit C or a noisy map C. Okay, and that will give us a, a incorrect uh, observable estimation, let's say uh, the, the expectation of some O tilde. Um, so error mitigation techniques are, are designed uh, to, to help improve this, this estimation, uh, for example, zero noise extrapolation and, and also probabilistic error cancellation, which will be uh, the, the topic of the first half of the talk. Okay, so, so this talk has two parts. First part is, is, is about a, a scalable mitigation uh, method based on probabilistic error cancellation. It uses an efficient and, and, and versatile uh, sparse Pauli Lindblad noise model. And it's intended to, to estimate observable expectation values. Uh, in the second half, um, we look at coherent Pauli checks and, and this is a technique that can be used to improve shot count accuracy. So not just averages over many circuits, just individual circuits. You want to make sure that your shot count is, is, is improved. Um, so, so you don't look at the uh, averages. Okay, so uh, the first part is, is about probabilistic error cancellation. And this is joint work with uh, Slatko Minev, Abhinav Kandala, and, and Kristen Tem. And, and it's published in this, in this paper. Okay, so let's first just look at an isolated noise channel, right? Um, so, so we have some lambda tilde here. Um, how do you characterize it, right? One way to do this is, is you can look at the Pauli transfer matrix of, of this noise channel, and it has elements defined by Pauli terms A and B, and it's computed, you, you, you prepare, let's say, a Pauli B, you, you apply the, the noise channel, and, and you measure the inner product with, with the Pauli A. And that will give you some number. Um, so that will give an, a matrix that, that looks like this, but that's very dense. It's four, four to the n by four to the n elements, and, and that's, a, that's a complicated uh, characterization. So what we can do is we can try and shape the noise, right? So we can apply Pauli twirling, and that's for, for a given Pauli i, you just apply it on the state before applying the noise channel, and then you apply it again. You do this for all of the Paulis you average, then on average, this will, off, will eliminate the off-diagonal elements in the Pauli transfer matrix, and you get a Pauli a channel for noise. So that, that noise channel is written here. It's just the sum of, of, of the Pauli terms applied on, 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 on this state, um, where, where the coefficients are non-negative and sum up to 1. OK, so suppose we have a, 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 um, a, a Pauli channel. How, how would we invert it? Right? That's, that's the whole purpose. So let's start with a very simple Pauli channel. It, it just has two terms. Well, one is just the identity and, and one minus alpha times some Pauli p. Okay, so you can work out that the, any questions yet? Oh, okay. Um, the inverse noise map uh, has a similar form. It's, it's uh, alpha times rho minus one minus alpha times the same Pauli uh, plus a scaling factor. So let's just plug in some, some alpha, just, just for clarity. Uh, you, you note that, that these two terms just sum up to one. Uh, so for sorry, it's, it's an unphysical map. You, you cannot implement it directly. But what you can do is you can apply it probabilistically. So what we want to do is we just want to apply the, the inverse. So first you compute the, the absolute uh, the sum of ab uh, absolute values of the terms. that gives you a scaling factor two here. And, and the rest, if you just ignore the, 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 the signs, you get a, a distribution. So you can sample according to that distribution, right? And then because we want to evaluate observables, if, if you sample it, you can classically apply the negative sign. And you can classically apply this, this factor of two. So you need to keep track of the signs and, and the scaling factor. Now, because you need to multiply by, in this case, a factor of two, that increases the variance and, and the scaling um, the, the sampling complexity grows by a factor of, of, of uh, gamma squared. So that's sort of the cost of, of, of doing this. 
Okay, so, so here's just an illustration. You have your, your noise channel. You're, you're going to sample a, a couple of, of circuits. You maintain the signs. You then average and scale by, by gamma. You, on average, implement your inverse noise channel. And of course, that should cancel, and then you have a, a noiseless gate or a noiseless uh, channel. Okay, so we still need something scalable. If, if you just look at an arbitrary uh, Pauli noise channel, not just a simple one, it has 4 to the n minus 1 coefficients. Um, if you invert it, it will typically have all of them. And, and, and you cannot really represent this for anything but a, a small uh, system. So what we want is a, a scalable approach uh, that, that looks at the noise in a more structured manner. Okay, and, and for this we propose the, the Pauli Limblad noise model. And, and what it does, it, it, it looks at the Limbladian uh, uh, master equation here um, with a, a Limbladian that just consists of Pauli jump terms, right? So this is in superoperator notation. You have some sum over a set of Paulis, and, and, and you include those Paulis in, in the model with some lambda k uh, parameter, okay? And if you do the math, then, then the noise model works out to be a, a product of the simple Pauli channels that we saw before. And here the product is you just apply one and you apply the other on top of on top of um, just until you apply all of them. And here the W is just one plus e to the minus two lambda k over two, where, where this was the lambda k. So this model is defined by a, a set of Pauli terms k and non-negative parameters, with non-negativity to make sure that the, the, the channel is, is physical. Um, now, this, this is a, a product of commuting simple Pauli channels, so it doesn't matter which way you apply them. And we already saw how to in, invert a single channel. So you just invert each one of those with, with the sampling procedure we, we saw earlier, and that makes it fairly easy. So you apply some Pauli to invert uh, each one of them. You can stack them all together, and you get one, one Pauli that you apply, which is easy to calculate. So, so we already know how to invert this. So uh, some properties of the channel. Um, if you have two of these channels uh, and, and you, you multiply them, in, you apply them in, in a row, uh, it just means you add the, 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 the lambda coefficients. The inverse noise map uh, just corresponds by negating this, this lambda values and, and, and you get this expression here. So, as I mentioned, if you, if you want to sample from this inverse distribution, you just sample the individual terms, and then you multiply all the Paulis, which is easy to do classically, and you also multiply both the signs and, and the scaling factor. So you get some overall scaling. Yes, question? How do you make sure that the lambda k is R greater or equal to zero? Do you have some control of that? Uh, yeah, I will get back to it. Yeah, sure. Um, now, of course, noise does not usually just arise in, 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 in without a gate. I mean, it does, but we are mostly interested in applying noisy gates and try to mitigate this. Okay, so how do we model a, a noisy gate? So here, here we have the noisy gate, and what we say is it's actually just a noise channel followed by the ideal gate. Okay, that's how we model it. Um, now, of course, what, what we said earlier is we want a Pauli noise channel. We want to apply this Pauli tw uh, twirling, which, which ideally is you just sample a Pauli before the noise channel. You have the noise channel, you apply the Pauli again, and then you apply the ideal gate. Now, if we could do this, we just omit the noisy, noisy channel and we just have the ideal gate, so we, wouldn't, we can't do that. Um, so to make this practical at this point, what we need to do is we need to uh, assume that, that these gates that, that we mitigate, the noise for, right? They're Clifford gates. And what we can then do is we can say, well, instead of first applying a Pauli and then the operator, we want to find a, a, a Pauli Q such that you can first apply the operator and then apply the Pauli, right? So you push it through. And it turns out this is just conjugating the, the original Pauli by, by, the, um, by the ideal gate. Okay, so if we do that, we, we, we can switch the order. And then, of course, this was just our noisy noisy gate. So what we've done now, if effectively, we've made the noise associated with this gate uh, a Pauli noise channel on average. Okay, so now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's assumed to be a, a Pauli noise channel. How do we characterize it, right? And 
Um, well, we, we can measure the, 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 the Pauli fidelities associated with the channel. So that, that's just defined here. You, you have your Pauli, you apply the noise channel, and, and, and you, you take the inner product. OK. So if it's in the context of, of, of a gate, it, it works a little bit like this. You, you want to trace individual terms through the noisy gates. So for example, here we have a self-adjoined uh, CZ gate. Let's say you start with a Pauli IX. Right? You then apply the noise channel, which is a diagonal Pauli transfer matrix, so you incur some, some, some fidelity IX. The, the Pauli term itself does not change, but then you apply the ideal CZ and you change the Pauli. It becomes a, a, a ZX. Then if you apply the noisy gate again, you get the fidelity of, of ZX, um, and then finally you, you map the ZX back to IX. So now we have the initial point is the same as the last one. They both started with IX. And, and we have a product of two fidelities. Uh, this we can measure, right? If, if you apply uh, uh, twirling at the, at, at the end of the circuit, you can do uh, spam-free, so state preparation and readout uh, error-free measurement of this. Um, we, we would like to have individual fidelities, um, but this, this is shown to be uh, uh, impossible by very nice paper. Right? Um, what turns out if, if, if the support of the Pauli changes, so if there's a, a, an identity at one location and, and a non-identity at the other location, you cannot measure them independently in a spam-free manner in this way. Um, if, if they were different, you can always apply single qubit gates and, and map them back and just, just repeat this procedure. So, what we do as, as to, to make it practical is to say, well, okay, in this case, we just say the fidelity of IX is the fidelity of ZX. Uh, that's sort of the best we can do in this case. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, if you apply readout twirling, you can measure elements of the form alpha F to the power K, where F in this case would be the product of those two fidelities plus some shock noise term. And alpha here is, is a term that, that measures the state preparation measurement error. It depends on the observable. Right? So here is an example. You, you, you repeatedly apply your gate. You get exponentially decaying curves. You fit the curves, and you get your fidelity f, so f hat. OK, so now we have uh, some, some uh, estimations of this. What do we do with them? Um, so uh, first of all, the, the Pauli fidelities and model parameters are, are related according to this. So, so the fidelity of some Pauli B is, is the sum over all of the noise terms, the symplectic inner product, which is uh, zero if, if the Pauli B and the Pauli model uh, Pauli K commute, otherwise it's one, um, times this, this lambda K model parameter. And, and that's how, how you get the fidelity for the Pauli channel. Okay, so this is log linear in the model coefficients. This is just, you could represent it as a vector of zeros and ones, and, and this is a vector of, of coefficients, so it's just in a product. Okay, so um, if, if you do this for a, a, a number of, of, let's say, benchmark fidelities in some set B, you can form a binary matrix uh, M. If you multiply it times lambda, you get minus log of the fidelity over two. Of course, fidelity is assumed to be larger than, than zero. So, so here's where non-negativity comes in, right? So this is just a linear system of equations. We want a lambda to be non-negative. So we say, well, it, it is assumed to be a physical channel. So we just enforce it by, by solving a non-negative least squares problem where we minimize the difference between m times lambda and uh, minus log f. So that's just uh, this expression here. So for this problem to, uh, to have a unique solution, we must also ensure that this, this matrix is full column rank. It, it can be tall matrix, um, but it, it should not have uh, a, a null space in the sense that there's multiple lambdas that give the same value. OK, so um, here's uh, just an illustration of how it works. Right? How do we select this, this set K? Well, we just say, well, it's a, it's a two local uh, model that follows the topology. So uh, that will give you a linear number of terms. So here's, here's an example of, of a number of qubits that we, we want to include in the noise model. Uh, first, we just do weight one Pauli terms 
on the individual qubits. So there's 11 qubits and, and three Paulis uh, of weight one, so x, y, and z on each term. That, that gives you a, a, a number of terms. Then there's 10 edges. Each of the edges have uh, x, x, y, z squared, so nine terms in total. And it gives you a total number of 123 parameters instead of 4 to the 11 minus 1, which is around 4 million. OK, now this would seem that you can only get uh, low weight noise. But actually, because we applied the, the sort of the Pauli channels independently, they can still combine into high weight noise. It's just lower, lower probability. Um, now, I, I mentioned that this M matrix has to be full rank. And, and if you choose these, these uh, uh, elements in, in K, it suffices to choose your benchmark to, to uh, coincide with K. You can always measure more because your matrix will just get, get taller. Um, and you can measure all of this information in nine, nine different bases. So that, that's how you learn the model. OK, um, any, any questions about the model of, or how to learn it? No. OK, so just, just an application. Uh, Abhinav gave a, gave a talk on Monday with a lot of uh, extensions and, 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 and big results. This is an uh, earlier result. Uh, it just looks at the trot version of a 1D transverse field Ising model um, with, with a Hamiltonian that consists of, of weight one terms and they bring uh, ZZ interactions. OK, so the first order trot decomposition, you just uh, split it along uh, the X terms and the ZZ terms. The X terms are implemented with, with just uh, Pauli X rotations. The ZZ terms are implemented by a, a C0 with a, a RZ with another C0, right? Um, because we want to do, uh, apply these on, on every pair, uh, that would give overlapping gates. So we just split it up into two different layers, right? Uh, layer one, where you sort of start at every, let's say, even qubit, and, and layer two, where you start at every odd qubit. OK, um, so that's, that's easy. We just have to learn the noise for two models, right? two, two, two different layers. Um, then we just apply the, the, the PEC noise cancellation uh, for, for different values of, of, of S, so that's the, the, the number of terms in the trotter expansion, and, and for a fixed, fixed time. Um, then we look at the mechanization, which is just the, the, the average of, of the, uh, the Pauli terms. right? Pauli X or Pauli Y, Pauli Z. Um, let me go back. So this is this is the ideal uh, result you would get, right? So so it's it's average Y versus average average Z. Um, if you don't apply PEC, um, you you get this spiral uh, as well, but it it, it just spirals in uh, very fast. With PEC, uh, you follow the, the 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 original spiral much much more closely. Uh, so here's a comparison. Um, and this is the plot that shows the, the, the relative distance uh, to, to the ideal, uh, ideal uh, case, um, uh, along with some bootstrap information. So you see that the technique can really help improve um, uh, performance. So this is the same uh, easing model just applied on 10 qubits. Right, and, and we look at weight, uh, weight 9 and weight 10 uh, observables. Um, this is also learned and mitigated on, 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 our, on our hardware. Uh, these are the weight uh, 10 terms uh, as a function of trotter steps uh, compared to the, the, the ideal one. So you see there's a big error. And, and with PEC, even, even for, for weight, weight 9 and 10 observables, uh, the error is pretty small. Um, so that was already first uh, first uh, part. Are there any questions about the first part of the talk? No. Yeah. You, you made this point somewhat about uh, Pauli twirling and the gates having to be Clifford. So what, what happens with non-Clifford gates? So um, what happens if it's not Clifford? <laughs> let's go back. Um, yeah. So. If, if, if you conjugate a, 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 a Pauli term with a non-Clifford, right, it will split up usually into two Pauli terms. But in, in the circuit that you had, you had non-Cliffords. Right? Yeah, so, so we just we, we, we only apply the techniques when, when we have Cliffords, right. Clifford gates. Right? So we, we mitigate the noise for, for those, those gates only. But the the, the non-Cliffords are not mitigated in some sense. Yeah.
Okay, so uh, let me slow down a little and um, go to the second part of the talk, which is a uh, coherent Pauli check. So this is joint work with uh, Sergei Bravi, uh, Jay Gambetta, Petar Djurcevic, uh, Dmitry Maslov, and, and Kristen Tepp. Um, so the coherent Pauli checks, uh, they serve to check for errors that happen during the exec execution of some Clifford circuit. Right? So it's again a Clifford circuit, um, but this, this time it can be, uh, can be a much larger circuit. It works by doing post selection. So, so you just re reject all the shots or the samples that fail to pass uh, the, the, the checks that you apply to them. And it will give you more reliable samples. So um, if you just have some Clifford circuit uh, operator U, well, if, if I choose any Pauli, I, I can just apply the same Pauli before the gate twice because it will cancel, right? That's, I, I didn't do anything yet. And then again, by applying conjugation, we can push L through U, right? So we move it to the other side. And, and R is just conjugation of, of, of uh, L by U. And that means we, we, we still have the same uh, circuit, but we just added Pauli's on either side. Um, okay, great. Um, we can extend this construction and, and also add another uh, an ancillary qubit, which we just call the check qubit. We, we start with Hadamard and then we apply the, the, the two uh, conditional Pauli's, and again, uh, followed by a Hadamard. Now again, this, this doesn't do anything in Hadamard's console, so we should measure uh, zero. Um, just like before, we can push this conditional L to conditional R at the other side, and, and uh, we have the same circuit, ideally. Now what happens if during the execution of the unitary, there's some, some error? We, we can push it through the end, let's say it's a Pauli error. Um, well, we can also push it through the uh, conditional Pauli and, and the Hadamar, and we end up at the end with some, some noise term, right? Now, if the, uh, if the error here at the end, or, or actually at the beginning, did not commute with the Pauli R, then we measure a one. Okay, so that, so yeah, so if, if the Pauli error did not commute, we, 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 um, we just measure one, and if it's, uh, if it's detected this way, we can just say, okay, this, this shot was, was wrong, let's just uh, throw it away. Okay, and, and this, this idea itself is not new, it's been, been proposed in earlier work, here's just the archive versions of the work, they have appeared in, in print as well. Okay, so, so this is just, just a reminder, if you have a controlled Pauli gate, let's say X, Y, I, Z, that's just a controlled independent uh, gate on each of the qubits, right? So, um, and here, controlled identity is just a, a free operation. Okay, now what you can say is, well, okay, we, we just added one check to our circuit. This is still a Clifford circuit, so we, we could just add more, more checks. So either we just apply more checks on, on the same set of qubits, you could also say, well, I'm even gonna include the, the previous check circuit as, as another uh, payload circuit, if you like. Okay, and if you randomly sample uh, these, these Paulish, you, you expect that each check sort of uh, reduces the number of errors by about 50%, right? Because half of, for any given Pauli, half of the Paulis anti-commute with it. Okay. Now, of course, if you add the, 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 the check, it could also have errors. So, so you can say, well, let's just add another little check on, on the check as a, as a flat qubit for, for more sanity. This is, this is just an extension. And you could see it as a, as a case where you have a very specific uh, Pauli check on top of your already checked circuit. Okay, now it turns out that if you're at the end of the circuit and you're preparing some measurement bases, right, you, you don't really care about Pauli Z errors at the end of the circuit, you just want to know if there's bit flips, right? So uh, you can just use Pauli Z checks on, on the right here to, to detect X and Y errors and then just determine what else should it be, right? Okay, but it turns out that, that we can classically implement these, these checks on the right, why? Well, let's just first insert identity here, just, just uh, matching Hadamars. And then you note that, well, if 
here we have Hadamard Mars with a, a, a conditional Z operation, and that's just a C naught, right? And, and C naughts we can also just apply classically once we measure it. We just, just apply to the bit string, that's not a problem. So we can take all of those gates and just get rid of them, okay? And the, the big advantage of this is there would be some idle time here while you apply the operator. That will be gone. Plus it also allows you to, to do uh, readout, readout error checks with, with the same mechanism. And the interesting thing is you, you could measure all of these check qubits even before you start applying the unitary. That's uh, just interesting. Okay, so how, how do we implement it? Um, so just for simplicity, of course, we, we assumed all to all connectivity, but, but this is not how, how the quantum processors usually work. Um, so um, uh, what we want to do instead is just to look at, at uh, linear nearest neighbor connectivity, right? Where each, each, each uh, qubit just have, uh, is connected to its neighbors directly. So how, how to implement that? Well, here we have a, a set of, of check qubits. Here we have a set of data qubits where we want to apply the circuit to. Right? Then you can implement it as, as one of the, the, the checks followed by a swap. One of the checks followed by a swap. And that means that, that we've now applied our, 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 our Pauli check on, on the qubits um, while sort of swapping the registers of qubits. Right? Um, so here we start with, with the checks at the, at, the, at the top here at the bottom. Now, the, the uh, advantage of this is that if, if, if you apply a, a swap, that's usually three C0 case, right? But you can combine those with, with, the, with the Pauli uh, operations for the check itself. So you can implement the Pauli plus a swap for the X term with, with just two C0s, right? The same for a, a Pauli Z check or a Pauli Y check. Both of them reduced to two, uh, two qubit gates. Um, somehow, interestingly, also, if you have an identity gate, you, you need three signals, so it becomes the more expensive uh, check to do. Um, you can do the same for the flags. You just, you just interleave them, and then they end up the way you want them to, to apply your actually Paolo check. OK, so of course, we want to uh, analyze this. Um, the quantities of interest are the post-selection rate. So that is how many shots do you keep or which fraction of the shots, right? Uh, how much do you throw away? And the logical error rate, which is the fraction of correct results after post-selection, right? So, so what, is, what is your eventual uh, accuracy? So you can formulate this as a Markov model. Uh, let's just assume that uh, all two qubit uh, uh, gates such as C0 have uh, depolarizing errors. Uh, there's no readout errors for now, no, no idle time read er errors. Um, and there's random Pauli checks, uh, so that gives you an independent detection rate of 50%. So this is, this is how you start to set up the model. You have your payload, it consists of a lot of circuits. You can push all of the Pauli noise to the end, you know what is the error rate. That's this, this epsilon here. So we then make a state vector that consists of a detected error, an undetected error, and no error. So the undetected error will be just, if you don't check, you, you, you don't detect it, so that's just the error rate. This is no error, and, and you don't detect anything at the beginning. Now, if you apply a check, so on the left and on the right, there's a chance that it's just, uh, okay, there's no errors by applying the, 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 the check itself, that's T okay. You have detected errors, so the error in, in, in the check it is, is detected by itself. Um, or, or uh, by the measurement, and you have undetected error, they sum up to one, okay? So every check, then you have a transition matrix that is applied uh, to the initial state, and you just repeat and add more and more checks this way. The, the post-selection rate then is given by this, this pi two plus pi three. The logical error rate is, is the undetected error divided by the post-selection rate. Okay. So, then, of course, we need to know what these, these t values are, right? So we assume that each two qubit is affected by some epsilon depolarizing noise, just, just like written here. Then uh, a detectable error happens with uh, 8 epsilon over 15, right? So there's, there's 8 bad Paulis in this case. Um, 
And if we have uh, K gate gates to implement uh, the check, then the probability you're okay is one minus epsilon to the power K, okay? Um, a detectable error happens if you have an odd number of errors, right? And that can be worked out to this. And then, of course, what we need to know is how many gates do we need to implement these checks? So just random checks, right? Um, then you can look at fully connected uh, left and right checks, left only or, or linear, and, and these are the uh, sort of the, the expectation value or the value along which they concentrate. Um, okay. So we can then look at the asymptotic logical error rate by, by uh, looking at the eigenvalues of T. And asymptotic here is in the sense of keep adding more and more checks, right? So. Uh, what we find is that the asymptotic error rate is if, if your uh, probability of, of applying the check uh, without errors is, is larger than a half uh, and, and your payload error is less than, than one strictly, then it converges to here. Otherwise, it will go to one. Okay. Now, of course, adding more and more checks will, will only decrease the post-selection rate and at every check it, 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 it shrinks by a factor of either a half or, or uh, TU plus T, okay? So that's undetected error. Um, towards the steady state, uh, the, the factor goes as, as T, okay? Right, so um, if, if, if you can ap apply the, the Pauli with probability 0.9, okay, then, then it, it doesn't shrink as fast. So let's look at numerical simulation. What you can do is you can represent Paulis by binary vectors of length 2n where you have uh, X components and Z components. Um, and then you can have a binary matrix where each row represents a, a, a error of a circuit, right? You just start out with no error and then you start to apply noisy gates. So um, for each gate you apply, you can just do uh, column operations so that pushes it through the gate. Then you apply noisy gates with just multiplying the Pauli terms. And then at the end of the circuit you get some Pauli term you can determine the syndrome. You don't need to really measure because you just know it was supposed to be zero and if it's now X or Y, it, it will flip. So that that's post, uh, won't pass post-selection. Um, and then you can also check based on the Pauli if, if, if the payload was affected by some, some error or not. Okay, and that gives you, you sample a lot, you get empirical post-selection and, and logical error rates. And this is the result for some, some example you randomly sample a 20 uh, qubit uh, Clifford circuit, you have some depolarizing noise, you, you generate 10 to the 5 shots or, or samples of your noise, and, and, and that will give you the, 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 the data points here plus the, uh, the model based on the Marco, uh, Marco, Markov chain, okay, along with the asymptotic error rate. Um, so it keep adding more and more checks does not reduce the, the uh, logical error rate to zero, but it, it can significantly decrease it, right? This is almost 100% error, and this is about 4% error. Okay, this is just a post-selection rate. You see it will just keep going down uh, at different rates. So eventually you just need a lot of shots. Um, that, that's shown here. This is sort of the overhead, and this is your logical error rate. So if you want to really push it towards the limit, you need to start sampling an awful lot. Okay, this is some, some experiments on, on, on IBM uh, Washington. It's just some information about the machine. Um, we just select two chains of, of, of qubits, so it's linear nearest neighbor topology, um, and, and look at how the technique works. So uh, this is a very simple uh, circuit. We just repeat uh, C naught gates 48 times. It's, it's not useful, but it, it just applies an identity circuit. Um, ten different instances, uh, just, just select the, 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 the Pauli checks and 250,000 shots per set, uh, setting, okay? And you see here, um, as the number of checks increases uh, for, for two qubits, the, the uh, logical error rate goes down uh, for four, uh, six, eight, and, and even for ten, the logical error rate uh, keeps going down. Now, of course, if we add more than 15 checks, this, this is already experiment with, with up to uh, 25 qubits. So uh, you, you need to uh, measure more and more. And of course, uh, the post-selection rate decreases. So that's why I need to take so many shots. You, you see there's a lot of variation here. Uh, this is the second chain, which is 
similar to the first, right? It, it, you see market drop in, in logical error rate um, as, as you increase the number of checks. Okay, this post-selection and, and you see you do really need to sample a lot for this method eventually. Okay. So here's just the table. You, you see the original error rate uh, after 15 checks, it, it, it goes to uh, this percentage, so that's, that's a, a big reduction. And, and this is for the second check. Okay, this is another example where the payload is a random permutation. So we're just going to randomly shuffle the qubits. But to make it interesting, we just initialize the, uh, the qubits with the EPR pars. So, so every uh, pair of qubits has an EPR par. That means that after, after your random permutation, there might be some, some uh, long distance correlations. Okay, uh, 10 random instances, again, a lot of shots. And you see um, that the error rate again goes down, not so much for, for the larger settings in this case. Okay. Um, this is post-selection, and again, it, 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 you, you need more shots. So for, for small problems, it seems to work pretty well. Can half the error here, uh, reduce it uh, quite a lot. For 10 qubits, it, it becomes harder. Um, one of the reasons for that is, is, is just because you apply a long Clifford circuit, you, you initia, initialize your, your qubits to zero, apply Hadamard, then you, you apply the Paulish, you wait a very long time to apply your, your payload circuit. They do nothing. They de decohere, and then we're going to apply the, the right Pauli check. So if we just look at this example in a one-sided manner, then at least up to six qubits, you see a reduction of the error rate. If we do two-sided, it will just go up. Every, error, every check you apply will just make it worse, right? uh, because the, 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 the delays only get longer. Um, and, and, and that means that every check you apply, it, it, it fills with higher probability. Uh, let's see. OK, so that, that's, that's what I describe here. Um, this is not drawn to skill, but, but usually this, this, this Clifford circuit the payload uh, is quite long compared to these, these stages, and, and that gives you idle time. Can I ask a question for, yeah. for that picture? If I imagine the U is given by an oracle, then you have to calculate the right, if you wanted to cut these R's by doing a measurement. Yes. But don't you have to know which U you use to calculate the R's? Yes, yes. So, so, so if this is given by an oracle, how do you do that? Well, you, you would still have to implement the oracle, right? And well, so you, you have to know what U is to actually do Yes, that. but also you can't apply an oracle on hardware, right? You you need to know which pulses you need to. Oh, okay, so, so there that, that. But yeah, if if you look at the more theoretical sense, then so yes. Then, then the oracle is given to the theoretical person who has <laughs> the calculation. Is that sort of? Yeah, that. Yeah. Then then you would have to somehow apply the oracle on the Pauli to to determine for a given L what would be the corresponding R, okay. or vice versa. Thank you. Yeah. That's very yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. If you're already there. Because I wanted to ask it later, but um, so you said you want to remove the right hand side, right? Because we can do this in classical post spectrum. Yes, if 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 this is if this is at the end of the circuit. Now, what you could do is is uh, I'll just use this illustration, right? You can just cal keep calculating with this and apply non Clifford gates, and then maybe apply another block of Cliffords. Okay, because as you mentioned. Yeah. That, that means I can just measure the top three qubits and then keep applying unitaries. So that just seems that I don't understand, to be honest. Yeah, so, so that was in the one side. So that, that happens if, if you're also eventually going to measure the data qubits, right? which you will in the end, but, but if, if this is at the very end of the circuit, then you can say, well, we can choose these, these right Pauli checks as Pauli Z checks, because we don't really care about Pauli Z errors. We don't need to check for them. Then, then this part of the circuit uh, can be implemented classically if you apply Hadamard here. And if you were to do this with multiple steps, you probably would do all the measurement at the end, I guess? 
you could do them mid 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 circuit, right? Where you measure these and then you just reinitialize them to zero, or yeah, yeah, that 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 should work still. Um, okay, so so of course we are, the, the 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 Markov model did not include idle time, uh, so um, we also wanted to look at this. So what we did was we just looked at a, a noise model for an actual backend, made it into Pauli noise. Um, and then do pretty much the entire Markov model, but with a lot more bookkeeping. Right? Um, for example, you need to really transpile your, your, your circuits, schedule them so you know at what time each gate is applied, and, and, and if there's any idle time between, you need to apply a noise model on the idle time. Um, so this is just uh, modeling, right? Where you, you, you have the data points that are the, the, the simulated ones plus the, the extended model for, for different T1 and T2 values. So we, we um, sort of divide by 0.2. We make them 0.2 uh, better to, to a, a noise level of 0.2, let's say. Um, so from, from left to right is, 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 is more and more realistic. And, and you see that if you have two-sided checks, so that is, that is uh, green and, and, and blue, uh, that's fine. But as soon as your T1 and T2 start to get worse, um, those methods start to fail. The one-sided check, because there's not much idle time, uh, pretty much stays, stays the same here. It also has a much nicer uh, post-selection rate. Um, another somewhat uh, surprising, perhaps not, but is, is that the, the Markov model really seems to capture the, the simulation data very well, um, despite some, some simplifying assumptions. Okay, so let me just skip through those. Um, you can also apply to qubit readout. So if, if you just say, I have an identity uh, circuit at the end, I can just apply it, right? Um, and that just means you have a C0 uh, to the ancilla qubit, which you can then check, right? And you can repeat this. And, and this idea also itself is not new. It's just another way to view it through this lens. Um, so what you do is you just do the one-sided checks. Um, that will include readout errors as, as part of the payload circuit, right? Um, and then uh, you just measure all of those qubits and you say that they all have to be the same, right? This is sort of a repetition code implementation. Um, or you can do major majority voting. Um, again, you can use the same Markov model to, to study the performance of this. You just say, okay, there's, there's some uh, target and, and control gate noise, measurement noise. How does it work, right? Um, this is if, if you have a readout error percentage, this is sort of the physical readout error, right? And this is the C0 error. If there's no checks, then of course uh, the, the error rate is independent of, of the C0 error. Um, but if, if the C0 gets better and, and, and you apply one check, then you can actually get a lot better readout error. So this, this is 0.1% if, if your C0 uh, grows like this if, if, if this would be a readout error, right? So you can choose a point on the grid, and these are just the ISO contours. If you apply two checks, it looks like this, three checks, and asymptotically it goes to here. This, this region doesn't improve, but, but here, even if, if, let's say, the readout error is, is 6%, if you apply enough checks, uh, you can get it to 0.1 overall if, if, your, if your CX error is, 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 is about 1%. So um, that can really help improve your readout. Um, these are some experiments on, on, a, on a chain of qubits uh, where we just want to measure one and we keep adding more and more terms here. Um, these are the results. So number of checks and, and the logical error rate. Uh, initially, it's, it's, it's somewhere um, around 2.5%. You apply one check, it, it goes down. and. It, it, it does not go much beyond this in this case, right? If, if you do a majority sampling, though, uh, it, it starts to go back up, right? It, it, it zigzags because at some uh, even number of, of checks you cannot define if I have two zeros and two ones, 
you cannot classify if it should have been a, a zero or one, so you have to just throw it out. Um, um, this is just if, if, if we increase the, the readout error classically, you can just make them worse, you can add more, more, more noise, and, and you see how, how the uh, additional checks would behave in, in that case. So I think that's all. Um,